Hey, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm. One of my favorite hobbies, and of course I've turned it into a business now, is to take stem cuttings from plants like this. This is a rose, but you can do this with many other plants around the landscape. You take the stem cuttings, you snip them up, trim them up, and you stick them in some potting soil. You get them to root out, and now you've got a genetic clone of the original. And with that new rooted cutting, you can go ahead and sell that, you can give it away, you can donate it to your garden club for a plant sale, you can plant it elsewhere in your garden. There's lots of things you can do with that. And honestly, I feel like I'm overselling this because most people get it. They understand it. They like the concept. But the problem comes down to execution. When a lot of people start this for the first time, they take the basic instructions. And on their first couple of attempts, they get the fail. Either the plants uh, rot while in that cutting tray, or they dry out, or they just sit there forever not doing anything. And that can be very discouraging. It's the most common question I get is, why did my cuttings fail? So in this video, I'm going to give you five reasons why cuttings fail and the ways you can fix them. Let's start with number one. In my experience, the number one reason why stem cuttings fail is over timing issues. Keeping in mind that you're taking a stem off of a living plant that is already doing something. It's in a stage that is either wanting it to continue growing, continue flowering or start flowering, or to go into dormancy. It's already thinking about doing something. And that stage that it's in, the firmness or softness of that stem, whether it's from the tip where it's very soft, a midsection where it's sort of semi-firm, or a lower section where it's fully firmed off, can make a lot of difference on whether it's in the right mood to make roots for you and unfortunately not every plant is the same in this regard. I'm going to throw up a chart on the screen right now that shows some of the differences between different plants and the different times you might take them cuttings and I might express it on this chart as either uh, soft cuttings, uh, semi-ripe cuttings or hardwood cuttings and it makes a difference. Uh, I'll give you some examples here. My favorite cuttings to take are things like things off of roses uh, which I do from semi-hardwood cuttings where I have my best success there but even within the rose there's a little bit of room for some varieties liking it a little bit on the softer side and other varieties like the old garden roses I find really like to be fairly firm before you take your cuttings off of them that part can only come from experience the rest you can learn from charts like these or resources online by sharing information I would uh, throw in here at this point that AI chatbots like uh, ChatGPT or Google Gemini can do a fairly good job of telling you what uh, stage is the best for your cuttings if you interrogate them very directly ask for sources then they'll go and they'll find the specific person who said hey this one is really good from semi hardwood or this one really takes softwood tip cuttings uh, very well so obviously it has to come from a healthy section of the plant that's super important too and it has to come at the right stage you'll find that your success rate goes way way up if you pay attention to that part of it the number two reason why I see cuttings fail is because the rooting medium is too wet or too dense. Now I could be more balanced in my conversation and say that sometimes cuttings are too wet and sometimes they're too dry and they can die for both reasons, but high 80s, high even into 90% of the time, when I see cuttings fail, it's on the wet side, not the dry side. And it comes down to that method we're using. Oftentimes we're using a humidity dome to protect humidity around these plants so they don't dry out. So we're attending to that part, but that, that soil, that soil that they're going into, the potting soil in this case, uh, can be too wet even to begin with and that contact with the wet soil against that bottom of the stem that you just took the cut from uh, can encourage the growth of rot organisms that overwhelm it before it has any kind of a chance to root. What you're going to see in this case is you're going to see that dark strip coming from the soil. As soon as you see darkness, a dark ring rising up from the bottom of the soil, the tissue is turning brown or black, that means it has failed due to dampness or wetness of that potting medium. Now obviously I want in my case, I like a sterile potting medium or a set, what I'm going to call a cleans potting medium, like an engineered propagation potting soil. And usually in those soils, they have lots of chunks of perlite. That's the white stuff you see in there uh, that will help it to drain very easily. They can do this with pumice. They can do it with sand. Uh, there's lots of ways they can engineer a propagation mix so that you don't end up with a lot of moisture up against the uh, stem of the plant. And as I say, then your control comes down to how wet do you make that I don't go in, it doesn't go in bone dry uh, but it just has to be just barely damped or barely moist before you put it you're cutting into it lock in that humidity dome your job after that as as regards humidity and moisture is to keep humidity around the plant but not on the base of the cutting 
In number three, I'm going to feature a reason that I think that a lot of new hobbyists get wrong is the application of rooting hormone. Now, rooting hormone, I'm going to call it rooting powder in this case, because that's my preferred method of application, comes in different flavors. It can be a low concentration, medium or high concentration, depending on the stage of growth and the plant that you're trying to take cuttings from. And so let's say 0.1% is the low dose. That would be for soft cuttings and easy to root cuttings, things that are uh, not taking a lot of extra encouragement to root and in fact for those plants uh, you might not even need the cutting the rooting powder itself coleus for instance probably won't even need any extra encouragement the medium flavor of rooting hormone might be something like 0.3 or 0.4 percent iba and that's the hormone that they're using in this case and that might be what you would use for semi hardwood cuttings like my roses or other uh, perennials or shrubs that are just slightly firmer and harder to get to root than the first group I talked about. The final group, the final uh, flavor of rooting hormone is the high concentration. That might be anywhere from 0.8% and upwards. I've seen it up to 1.6% at times or even higher. And that's for hard to root things. Uh, you know, think about a dormant cherry tree or something like that, uh, where the, the tissues are very firm and they're gonna be very hard to convince to go ahead and start developing new roots. So you use a higher concentration of rooting hormone. A couple of comments on this. Some people ask the question, can I do this method without rooting hormone at all? And my answer to that is, of course you can. You can set up all the good conditions and uh, take the cuttings at the right stage, but the rooting hormone makes it faster and sometimes speed equals success, meaning that if you don't use the rooting hormone, it can lag so long that it runs out of moisture, runs out of nutrients, or just fails before it gets a chance to root. So I would really encourage it if it's available in your jurisdiction. Uh, I've made other videos where I talked about the safety of rooting hormone and the, and the sort of uh, analysis of its effectiveness. So I'll include that here as well in case you're interested. Reason number four why cuttings fail is because of uh, inconsistent humidity application or just them drying out. This would be the counterpoint to number two. While you certainly don't want to see the cuttings rot, uh, if you leave them in too uh, dry of a situation in terms of the air around them, then they may dry out before they get a chance to root. Uh, usually the measure that you use for this is either something like a humidity dome, which can come in many, many different forms, either the bins that I use, some people use pop bottles, so might Kincaid did that famously in one of his videos. I did one on milk jugs last year. Uh, there's lots of ways to do this, but the point is to trap some humidity in the air around the cuttings while still allowing some ventilation or air circulation so it doesn't trap too much of that moisture. It, as I say, it is a balancing act. Uh, mistakes that rookies make sometimes is that they leave their cuttings in too sunny a location. Uh, sunshine equals a light energy, sure, uh, but they can't do that much with the energy at this point, so they, let, they, they take less light than you need and what happens when you put them into that high sunshine situation is it heats up and dries out very very quickly which can lead to a quick decline of those cuttings they'll drop their leaves they're stressed out so uh, number four reason uh, just not maintaining a consistent level of humidity which can sometimes be visually seen by seeing a condensation on the inside of that humidity dome Reason number five I'm going to discuss here is because you have dull or dirty tools, uh, dirty pots, trays, or propagation medium. So basically this is the sanitation question and the maintenance of your tools. And what it comes down to, I, I've misapplied, I probably even did it in this video earlier, the term sterile. We're not looking for sterile, not from a operating theater kind of point of view, but we are looking for clean, clean enough to do the job. Uh, so when you have a, a set of pruners like this one here, uh, just giving it a spray with Lysol or using Lysol wipes or Clorox wipes on the blades can reduce the chances that you're transferring bacteria, fungus, uh, even virus in, in some cases from one cutting to the next, which can be detrimental either to its success as a cutting or its later success as a plant. Um, the other thing that you can do to it is sharpen this because what you're looking for on the bottom of that stem is a very clean cut, no flaps of skin or broken or anything like that because that extra tissue that's not going to survive the uh, cutting process is there and can obviously attract pathogens and rot and so on. Um, 
same thing as I say, uh, we're not looking for surgical theater kind of accuracy on your pots and trays, uh, and certainly not your soil, but you are looking for the cleanest possible you can look for. So you're not getting garden soil. You're not getting the, uh, the, the compost from the garden or the, or the compost pile, uh, because that has too much life in it, too much organic matter and too many uh, microbes already in it. If you get something that is either peat or wood or coconut fiber based uh, with the perlite in it that's an engineered potting mix, you get much better or more consistent results anyway uh, because of the cleanliness of your tools, your rooting medium, and your uh, trays and pots. All right, that's my whole video on the topic. I tried to keep it quick and as specific as I could, but obviously I'm going to have left some things out. And that's where the comments section comes in. Either leave your questions in the comments below this, let's start a discussion there. Or a new feature on YouTube is they have the community tab on my channel. So just go through to my main channel and look for the community tab there. And you can leave your community posts, questions, and I see quite a good conversation already starting there on propagation. So that's a way that you can call on the knowledge of people who have experience already doing this and can answer your questions directly and I'll be checking in there as well. Thanks so much for watching.